Years ago, the great screen actor Jimmy Cagney was working with a young actress that was about to be fired. Uh, he went to the director and said, let me talk to her. And he walked over to the actress and he said, look, it's simple. You walk in the room, you plant your feet, look me in the eye, and tell the truth. The logo of the X-Files is the truth is out there. The truth is out there. I'm going to paraphrase. The truth is in here. You're about to hear the truth. I'm an actor. My name is John Cipher. For seven years, I walked through the door, planted my feet, and tried to tell the truth as Chief Daniels on Hill Street Blues as General Craig on the hit sitcom Major Dad. I was two years on Dynasty, you're on Knott's Landing, I've done five afternoon soap operas, 12 Broadway shows and 20 films. One of the Broadway shows I did was the great musical Man of La Mancha on Broadway. I was Richard Kiley's original understudy. I sang the words to dream the impossible dream, to fight the unbeatable foe to bear with unbearable sorrow, to run where the brave dare not go. I'm here to introduce your host this morning, Dr. Stephen Greer. He's a man who is running pell-mell where the brave dare not go. He was an emergency room physician. In fact, the director of emergency medicine at a major hospital in North Carolina. Three years ago, he sat his wife and his four daughters down and said, I've been doing this part-time, running after the truth, for seven years now. Now I'm going to do it full-time. He walked away from all that money to pursue the truth. I always think of Hamlet's great line to Horatio, there are more things between heaven and hell than are dreamed of in your philosophy, Horatio. I'm going to introduce a man who says, there are more things between heaven and hell than any of us have accepted. And I have the witnesses and the documents to prove it. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Stephen Gould. Thank you very much, John. Uh, members of the press, the American public, and people of the world. We are here today to disclose the truth about a subject that has been ridiculed and questioned, denied for at least 50 years. The men and women who are on this stage and the some 350 additional military intelligence witnesses to the so-called UFO matter and extraterrestrial intelligence can prove and will prove that we are not alone. I would like to thank Sarah McClendon, who is with us today, the famed White House correspondent, for her sponsorship of this meeting. Thank you very much, Sarah. In 1993, a group of uh, military advisors to this project and I met out in the countryside in Virginia. And we decided that it was time for civilians, military, intelligence, and other people to come together to disclose the truth about the subject which is called UFOs. Since that time, I have personally briefed a sitting director of Central Intelligence, James Woolsey, President Clinton's first CIA director. I have personally briefed the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, the head of Intelligence Joint Staff, members of the Senate Intelligence Committee, many members of Congress, members of the European leadership, the Japanese cabinet and others. And what I have found is that none of them are surprised that this is true, but they are uniformly horrified that they have not had access to these projects. We can establish through these witnesses whom we have identified, which now number over 400, and these are people who have been inside the CIA, NSA, 
NRO, Air Force, Navy, Marines, Army, all divisions of the intelligence and military community, as well as corporate witnesses, contractors to the government. And these are folks who have been involved in so-called black budget or covert unacknowledged projects. These unacknowledged special access projects are taking in at least 40 to 80 billion dollars per year. And they are sitting on technologies that can change the world forever. The reason we are coming forward now is that we are asking for the U.S. Congress and for President Bush to move towards an official inquiry and disclosure on this subject. It has the most profound implications for the human future, for the U.S. national security, and for world peace. Specifically, technologies connected to UFO and extraterrestrial vehicles, if declassified and used for peaceful energy generation and propulsion, would solve the looming energy crisis definitively, would end global warming, would correct the environmental challenges that the Earth is facing. It is also critical that we begin to debate as a society the propriety of placing weapons in space. If indeed, as we can prove, it is true that we are not alone and that space is territory which we are sharing with other civilizations, it could be a very imprudent, destabilizing thing to place weapons in space. This is not being debated because it is off the national and international radar screens. It needs to be placed on it, and we are here today to do it. We can establish through this testimony that these objects of extraterrestrial origin have been tracked on radar going thousands of miles per hour, stopping and making right-hand turns, that they use anti-gravity propulsion systems, which we have already figured out how they work in classified projects in the United States, Great Britain, and elsewhere that these objects have landed on terra firma, at times have been disabled and have been retrieved specifically by teams within the United States, that extraterrestrial life forms have been retrieved and their vehicles have been taken and studied thoroughly for at least 50 years. We can prove through the testimony and documents that we will be presenting that this subject has been hidden from members of Congress and at least two administrations that we are aware of, presidential administrations, and that the Constitution of the United States has been subverted by the growing power of these classified projects and that this is a danger to the national security. There is no evidence, I wish to emphasize, that these life forms from elsewhere are hostile towards us but there is a great deal of evidence that they are concerned with our hostility. There are times when they have neutralized or rendered inert the launch capabilities of intercontinental ballistic missiles. Witnesses here today will describe those events to you. They have shown clearly that they do not want us to weaponize space, and yet we are proceeding down that dangerous path. And it will be established that these projects because they have not been supervised properly by the Congress, by the U.S. President, by the international community, have become a threat to the national security. And for this reason, we feel we must disclose the facts. This is the beginning of the campaign for disclosure. And in a memo that I wrote to President Bush last week, I have stated that this campaign will persist until our goals are met, and they are as follows. That we have open, honest hearings on the subject in the U.S. Congress. That there be a permanent ban on the weaponization of space or the targeting of any objects of extraterrestrial origin. That there be a full and complete study of classified technologies connected to this subject to see how they could be properly declassified and applied for peaceful energy generation so that the world may get off of fossil fuels in enough time to prevent 
greater ecosystem damage or war over the looming energy crisis, which is sure to sweep the earth in the coming decade. This is a matter of the most pressing import. It has been ridiculed, yes. I know many in the media would like to talk about little green men. But in reality, the subject is laughed at because it is so serious. I have had grown man, men weep who are in the Pentagon, who are members of Congress, and who have said to me, what are we going to do? Here's what we will do. We will see that this matter is properly disclosed. And these courageous witnesses, the first 21 of over 100 that we have already interviewed on videotape, have stepped forward to speak the truth. Now, I expect people to be skeptical, but not irrationally so, because these men and women have come forward and they have their credentials, they can establish who they are, and they have been firsthand witnesses to some of the most important events in the history of the human race. As was pointed out to me by some of the men here, they were charged with handling the nuclear weapons of the United States. Their word was trusted on everything of great importance for the national security. We must trust their word now. As Monsignor Balducci said at the Vatican, in an interview I had with him recently, it is irrational not to accept the testimony of these witnesses. So please be skeptical, but that is not the same as prejudiced and closed-minded. This is a matter of great importance, and I ask the media, the scientific community, and the political community to look seriously at this matter and to do the right thing for humanity and for our children. We have available for the media and for members of Congress a nearly 500-page briefing document with transcripts from dozens of these top secret witnesses. We have a four-hour videotape summary, it's not a commercial product, I warn you, from this project of the 120 hours that we have in interviews so far. They've been boiled down to four hours and it's available for the Congress to review and for the major media to review. We can establish that this subject is real and has tremendous significance for the human future. I ask on all of you who are listening to contact the members of Congress that represent you and the leaders around the world and other countries and ask them to hold an honest inquiry into this subject to support a ban on weaponizing space since we are sharing space with other life forms and that we move quickly as a people to understanding that this is the end of the childhood of the human race. It is time for us to become mature adults in the cosmic civilizations out there. To do this, <clears throat> we must become a peaceful civilization. And we must look as we go into space with an intent of cooperating with other civilizations, not weaponizing that high frontier. The men and women who will speak next will do so in order, beginning on your left. They will introduce themselves. I ask for the media to refrain from questions until each witness has spoken briefly about who they are and what they have personally been involved with or witnessed in their government, military, or government-connected careers. At the end, we will have questions. All of you may ask questions for as long as we can stay here and we will provide you with all the information that you need. So we will begin now with the first of our witnesses, Mr. John Callahan. My name is John Callahan. I'm a retired FAA employee. I was the division manager for the Accidents Evaluation and Investigation Division in D.C. About two years before I retired, I received a call from Alaska region where the uh, region wanted to know what to tell the media. When I questioned, tell the media what, he says about the UFO and 
It went downhill from there. What UFO? It turned out, I told him what any government employee would do at that time was to tell him it's under investigation. And then I had him send all that data to the FAA's tech center in Atlantic City. The next day, my uh, immediate boss, service director, Javi Safir, and I went to Atlantic City. I had just purchased a, uh, a new video camera, and I videoed the, uh, the event. And the Lake City, we had them play back on a, uh, on a scope, you would call it a scope, a plan view display, PVD, exactly what the pilot uh, uh, seen or what the controller seen, and we uh, tied that in with the voice uh, tape so we could hear exactly what the controller said and what he heard, and we taped it. We came back the next day, uh, briefed the administrator, Admiral Ingen, on what happened. He wanted a five-minute briefing. After we started the briefing, he wanted to know if he could see the video. We put the video on. He watched the video, the whole video. The next day, uh, he set up a, uh, a meeting for me to give a dog and pony show to President Reagan's scientific staff and whoever they brought over and to hand off all that data to them. That uh, morning in the FAA round room, it was either 9 or 10 o'clock, uh, three men from uh, Reagan's scientific staff three CIA people, three FBI people, and I don't remember who the other guys were, along with all the FAA experts that I brought with me that could decide or talk about the hardware and the software, how it worked. We put on a dog and pony show. We let them watch the video. We had all the data there. We had all the printouts that the computer uh, uh, put out. They got all excited over it. When it was all done, the uh, CIA, uh, one of the CIA men told the people they were now sworn to secrecy that this meeting never happened and this event never happened. When I asked them why, uh, uh, you know, I thought it was probably just a stealth bomber at the time, he says, well, this is the first time that we have uh, recorded radar data on a UFO, and these guys are going to get all excited uh, drooling over all this data. I said, well, you're going to tell the public about it. And he says, no, we don't tell the public about this. It would uh, panic the public. He says, we're going to go back and study this. I said, okay, that uh, was what he was going to do. Now, I've told this story many times, and I get sometimes funny looks from people. I have with me the uh, voice tapes of the uh, controllers that were involved, the FAA original tapes. See, after we handed this stuff off to the president's staff, the FAA didn't know what to do with it. We don't separate UFOs from real traffic, so it's not our problem, okay? <laughs> I have a copy of the original of the uh, video that we took, which is rather interesting. And once, once the thing was all over, the reports started coming into my office, but because it wasn't an FAA air traffic problem, the FAA's report ended up on a table in my office. And it stayed there until I retired when one of the staffers packed up all my gear and helped it move to my house. Also, in a box I found just a few good days ago, in my 1992 tax return, I have the target printouts from the uh, computer data, which so if you wanted to or, or, or look at every target that was up there at the time, you can now reproduce this from this piece of paper here. And it's called the UFO Incident, uh, Japan 1648, I believe the number was, that happened on November the 18th, 1986. Uh, I'm prepared to go to Congress, to swear before Congress that everything I've told you people and everything that is here is the truth. Thank you. Good morning. I hope you'll pardon me. I'm a little bit nervous. My name is Charles L. Brown. I'm a lieutenant colonel, U.S. Air Force, retired, subsequently seven years with the Foreign Service. I like the name Charlie Brown, a gentleman by the name of Charles Schultz, of great talent, sort of uh, elevated the name, if you will. Uh, during World War II, I was a young farm boy from West Virginia. I got the patriotic bug, joined the United States Army, ended up flying bombers in Europe and ended the war transport in the Pacific. Finished college in the summer, late summer of 49, recalled to active duty in the newly formed United States Air Force. 
I was assigned to an organization called Office of Special Investigations. The Air Force, as most of you know, was formed in 1947. OSI as a central investigative agency for the Air Force was formed, I think, in 1948. So everything was relatively new. Needless to say, starting in 47, UFOs were rather new. The Air Force Intelligence, or Air Technical Intelligence Center was at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and I had my office in a building adjacent to it. And our organization was the worldwide investigative agency for the Air Force for any unidentified flying objects. This lasted for about two years. The project name was known as Project Grudge. It was the predecessor to a project known as Blue Book, which Ed Rupelt headed. During my experience with it, I would collect the data from, I didn't collect it, it was sent into my office. I analyzed it. As a pilot investigator, I was able to offer some bits of advice to the air technical intelligence people. Now, you might visualize a massive office, but as I recall, we had a first lieutenant, uh, a secretary, and a technical sergeant. That was the essence of Project Blue Book when it started, or Project Grudge, Blue Book, and it expanded somewhat. During the review as an analyst of these various documentary reports, if you will, or documents, I became clearly convinced that there was substance to what was being reported in that we had ground visual, ground radar, airborne visual, and airborne radar confirmation of some of these sightings. The individuals who made the sightings were everything from airline pilots, military pilots, police officers, some of the people that your lives depend upon on a daily basis. These are very reputable and credible people. I hope that the testimony here from very credible people will convince you of that and will further Steve Greer's disclosure project in that pressure needs to be brought to bring this to the attention, not only of the Americans, but of people all over the planet. These vehicles have been seen and confirmed all over the planet. I am willing to sign a sworn statement or testify to my judgment and to what I have observed. Such things do exist. Please believe me. Please believe the, those to follow me. Thank you. My name is Michael Smith. I was in the Air Force, a sergeant from 1967 to 1973. I was aircraft control and warning operator. While I was assigned to Klamath Falls, Oregon in early 1970, I arrived at the radar site and they were watching a UFO on a radar that was hovering at about 80,000 feet. It sat there for about 10 minutes and then slowly descended uh, until it dropped off the radar. It was gone for about 5, 10 minutes and then instantly reappeared at 80,000 feet, stationary. The next sweep of the radar, it was 200 miles away, stationary. And it hovered there for about 10 minutes and redid the whole cycle twice more. When I found out what the normal what you normally do when you see a UFO. I was told that you notify NORAD, you don't necessarily write anything down, you don't write anything down, and you keep it to yourself. It's a need-to-know basis only. And NORAD one night called me about later in the year to let me know as a heads up that there was a UFO coming up the California coastline. I asked them what I should do about this. They said, nothing, don't write it down, just, it's just a heads up. And then late 1972, while stationed at the 753rd Radar Squadron in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, I received a couple of panicky calls from police officers who were chasing three UFOs from Mackinac Bridge up I-75. So I immediately checked the radar, confirmed that they were there, called NORAD, and they were concerned because they had two inbound B-52s going to Kinslow Air Force Base. So they diverted them because they didn't want 
I mean, proximity of the two. And that night I answered many calls from uh, the police department, sheriff's department and stuff. And my standard response was that there was nothing on radar. And I will testify to this under oath to a congressional hearing. Good morning. My name is Enrique Kolbeck. I am a traffic controller. I'm sorry uh, for my English. I'm so scared. I'm not accustomed to talk in front of a lot of people. Um, I'm here because I'm uh, being a witness in a voluntary way uh, on my work. Uh, I work in Mexico City as radar controller and the International Airport of Mexico. And uh, I'm going to give an example about this uh, science that we have in Mexico for several uh, years. And uh, this uh, issue happens a lot of times in my country, unfortunately. For example, in March 4, 1992, we detected 15 objects uh, west side of the Toluca Airport, that is very close of our international airport, at uh, 50 miles, more or less. Then, uh, uh, July 28, 1994, we have an, uh, um, almost a collision or something that we can name in that way. Uh, with an international flight, I mean, uh, domestic flight of Iron Mexico 129, commands by the uh, pilot uh, Raimundo Cervantes Ruano, that has a trash or something about in his main uh, landing year in the right leg. Uh, that's occurred at night at 10:30, uh, more or less. Then, in the next week, uh, the same year, in the same uh, moment, uh, the Aeromexico Fly 904 has another almost collision that was reported for the pilot Corso, the Capitan Corso, at 11.30 in the morning, and we detect that uh, object on a radar. Uh, um, suddenly, uh, just for a moment. Then, uh, in the next week, we have a lot of sightings reported by the pilots that give us information about the uh, weird uh, traffic or something, uh, bright lights and uh, different times. And we detect some of them uh, in, in, in that uh, week. But in uh, September 15 of 1994, we have an, uh, a detection about uh, five hours, more or less, on a radar and a new equipment that we believe that uh, that equipment was uh, working in, in not a good way because uh, uh, it's not uh, human that you have uh, detection by five hours of the same object and apparently without movement. Well, we concur with the technical uh, persons of radar in our country that the radar system was working well and uh, on and it was very exciting and we surprised when uh, at the next day we received information about uh, a parodist named uh, Jaime Maussan that is uh, studied these cases in Mexico about that uh, a sighting a lot from a lot of people in the Metepec city uh, there is uh, another point uh, located southeast of the Toluca airport about a uh, uh, sighting of the big um, flying saucer, apparently uh, 50 meters of diameter, than uh, for a lot of people, and uh, w that uh, let the trash is something in, 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 the, in, in the ground. Well, next in uh, November 90, 24, 1994, uh, we have an, uh, on service officially our new radar system. And uh, after that moment, we have uh, information very uh, exactly about of these sightings at the same time with the pilots and detections. Uh, that's why I'm here, because we consider in my country that this is very dangerous. We have a lot of more cases, but I don't want to use more time in this. But uh, uh, it's very important that the people uh, 
and the world knows these events and uh, consider that could be very dangerous for aeronautical situation, especially in my country. I don't know why in my country that's occurred frequently, but the, the point is that it happens, and, uh, and we consider it dangerous. And we had only, uh, unfortunately, one trash, but we don't want to have an, another more. Thank you very much, and I'm sorry for my English. My name is Graham Bethune. I'm a retired Navy commander, pilot, had a top secret clearance. 50 years ago, February the 10th, 1951, I was flying from Keflavik, Iceland to Argentia, Newfoundland. It was at night, it was dark. About 300 miles outside of Argentia, I saw a glow on the water, like approaching a city at night. As we approached this glow, it turned to a monstrous circle of white lights on the water. We watched this for a while, the lights went out, there was nothing on the water. Next thing we saw was a yellow halo, small, much smaller than whatever it was launched from, and that was 15 miles away, up to our altitude. Because of the trajectory, I disengaged the autopilot, shoved the nose over to try to go under this thing. And at that time, I heard a noise underneath, I thought maybe it hit us, it was actually some of the crew members ducking and they collided and a couple of them were injured. Then it appeared over to the right and moved out slowly and flew with us. It was still not at our altitude, but we could see the shape of it. It had a dome. We could see the, we could see the coronal discharge. I went back aft, let the other pilot, Al Jones, take my seat to see what the passenger's reaction was. Came back to the cockpit, told him not to report anything, simply because what that the psychiatrist had said to me, maybe they would lock us up. So basically, the instruments in the cockpit, we had four or five failures in the area of magnetic compass, you know, the electromagnetic effect, in the area of directional finders, and this type of thing. The craft was tracked by radar in excess of 1,800 miles an hour. It never did get to our altitude. We had 31 passengers, plus the psychiatrist and the crew members that all sighted this at, at different areas. When we landed at Argentia, Newfoundland, we were interrogated by the Air Force, an excellent interrogation, Captain Paulson. When we landed at the Naval Air Test Center here at Patuxent River, we were required by Navy intelligence to make out individual reports. Out of the National Archives, I have the, the 18 page official Navy and Air Force report. I've made up a, a report to straighten out all the truth. There's a stack of books out there this high that have written all of this up. So the truth is here. I will testify under oath before Congress that everything that I have said is true. My name is Dan Willis. I was in the United States Navy. I held a top secret crypto level 14 extra sensitive material handling security clearance. I worked in the code room at the Naval Communications Station in San Francisco. In 1969, I received a priority message from a ship near Alaska that uh, was classified as secret. The ship reported uh, merging out of the ocean uh, near Port Bow, a brightly glowing uh, reddish-orange elliptical object, approximately 70 feet in diameter, emerged out of the water, <coughs> shot into space, uh, traveling at about 7,000 miles per hour. This was uh, tracked on ship's radar and substantiated. Uh, years later, I worked at the um, Naval Electronic Engineering Center in San Diego for 13 years. The um, co-worker who I worked with worked at the NORAD facility. When he first started working at the facility, he noticed objects going on the screens that track everything out in space and in the air, objects going off the scale, doing right angle turns. When he inquired, uh, his older supervisor advised him that, uh, quote, it was just a visit from one of our little friends. I thought this was a little unusual. 
Uh, these statements are true and willing to testify under oath before Congress. Thank you. My name is Don Phillips. I was in the United States Air Force and uh, had worked with certain intelligence agencies of the United States government. Prior to my Air Force, uh, uh, prior to joining the Air Force, I worked for the famous Lockheed Skunk Works. And I was working for them when I was attending college and I worked, them, I worked for them in the capacity as a design engineer. It was one of my proudest moments of my life to work with a man by the name of Kelly Johnson. A lot of you might be familiar with that. Uh, it turns out that the models of aircraft that we were building, as you know, uh, were all classified, were in the deep black, and that I came in on, on the end of the U-2 project. My main project was known later as the SR-71. The SR-71 had a predecessor. It had a special model built for the CIA. And that those models were one, one passenger, one pilot, special aircraft, in order to get from one place to another very, very quickly. Now these SR-71s, as we know them, the Blackbird, are the type of aircraft that are still classified in a sense as far as the altitude that it flies at and also the speed records that it holds. I'm very proud to say that this aircraft played a big part in helping to end the Cold War. The aircraft, the predecessor aircraft, there's strong evidence to suggest that perhaps these aircraft had a different role once in the air. Each pilot and I knew a few of them. Each pilot had an assignment before they took off, okay? They learned about the assignment immediately prior to take off, and there's strong evidence to suggest that there was a dual role in that they were monitoring some type of traffic to and from planet Earth. This can be verified at a later point this was, pro I'll jump into my military experience. My first field assignment for the United States Air Force was at Las Vegas Air Force Station. And that was my first experience with Las Vegas and I couldn't understand why people were being so uh, excited about going to a place such as this, but I soon found out about a year later. Uh, Nellis Air Force Base is located there. Nellis is a major training center for different types of special aircraft and fighter aircraft one of the premier training sites for pilots all around the world. However, when I learned that my assignment was at a radar site 50 miles out of town, up near Mount Charleston, uh, I had no idea where, we'd, where I'd be, so finally in the daylight, I was able to find the location and report it in, uh, in 1965 for duty. In 1966, Early in the morning, about 1 to 2 a.m., I was sleeping, I was staying there on base, and our barracks were at about mm, 8,000 feet. I heard a lot of commotion. You know, at that altitude, sound carries. Sound carries tremendously. And I thought, well, it's early in the morning, it's summertime, and there is a lot, it's very warm and maybe I should get up and take a look. I didn't really want to, but I got up and took a look, walked up to the main road up near my office, which was the commander's office. I was on the commander's staff, Lieutenant Colonel Charles Evans. And I couldn't, I, I was saying, who's making all this noise? Who's making all this noise at this time of the morning? So when I got within about 50 yards, of the five, four or five people that were standing there, one being the chief of security, they were looking up in the air and I said, gee, they all, their heads are all head, uh, looking at the same direction. Well, I looked up to the west, northwest, and to my amazement, there were lights flashing around the sky, moving at anywhere from what seemed like 2,400 uh, 2, to about 3,800 miles per hour. Now, the fact 
that we're taking an estimate from a distance, uh, you know, we figured, well, this is, this is quite something. However, we continue to watch these, fly, these darting lights go across the sky and stop, absolutely stop, come to a dead stop and reverse in an acute angle their direction and then proceed on in sort of, they were traveling so fast that you could almost see a pattern left by, if you are computer people, when you move a mouse real quick across the screen, you see a little bit of a tail. Well, that's exactly the way these six or seven craft worked. After five minutes of watching these things, they all seemed to group up to the west, northwest, okay? They started to come in on a circle. But what I would like to point out is that where they were putting on their display in the north, northwest sky, just directly east of that is what is known as Area 51. Area 51 is a AEC name, okay? Atomic Energy Commission. That was the old name for Atomic Energy Commission. We knew it as the Groom Lake Flight Test Facility in the Air Force. And it was where we tested our aircraft at the, after we got the prototype made from the Skunk Works. So here are these, let's get back to the circle in the sky. What they did was coalesce and, and started rotating in a circle and then they disappeared. Well, I thought, gee, this is something that we have to keep quiet. And that was verified by the chief of security. But we waited there and talked it over for a little bit. And it seemed like, I think it was an hour. Then came the radar people from the scopes, which were at 10,000 plus feet, came down for their dinner at 2 o'clock in the morning. And the first person off the bus was a good friend of mine, Anthony Kesar. He said, he was white as a sheet, and he says, did you see that? Yeah, we all said, yeah, yeah, it was a nice display. What a show. He says, we documented them on radar. And he says, we didn't give them clearance. We just, the standing order was let them fly through the radar beam. He says, we documented six to seven UFOs. Now, we don't know who was guiding those, but they were certainly intelligent. And uh, we don't know where they landed because they coalesced and disappeared. So I will say at this point, to keep it short, that I will testify under oath as to what I say is true. And I will do so before Congress. Thank you. My name is Robert Solis. Uh, contrary to what it says on the card, I was not a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force. I was in the Air Force uh, active duty after I graduated from the Air Force Academy in 1964 until 1971 and separated as a captain. In uh, uh, March of 1967, I was stationed at Malmstrom Air Force Base, Montana uh, as a missile launch officer, Minuteman missiles. Uh, on an on a early morning of uh, March 16th, 1967, I got a call from my security guard, primary security guard upstairs. Uh, we had about uh, six, as I recall, uh, flight security uh, airmen upstairs. I was downstairs 60 feet underground in a capsule uh, monitoring and uh, controlling 10 uh, nuclear-tipped Minuteman missiles. Uh, I got a call that morning uh, that they were seeing strange lights flying in the sky. Uh, I, I disregarded that call. I uh, told them to uh, call me when something more significant happened. Um, I got another call uh, subsequent to that call, and this time it was a more uh, intense tone in the, in the guard's uh, voice. It was very, clearly very frightened. Um, he said there was a... Uh, a bright glowing red object hovering outside the front gate. It was oval shaped. Um, he had all the other guards out there with their weapons drawn. Right after that call, I woke up my commander who was on a rest period, uh, uh, Fred Mywald, a retired colonel now, uh, and uh, told him about the phone calls. As I was telling him about the phone calls, my weapons started going down. Uh, one after the other. They went into a no-go condition, what we call no-go condition. They were unlaunchable. Um, <clears throat> we lost uh, somewhere between uh, six and eight weapons that morning. 
uh, within minutes of having received that second phone call of uh, a UFO hovering outside the front gate. Uh, uh, again that morning, we were, after reporting it to the uh, command post, uh, we, were, we were informed that a similar, very similar incident happened at Echo Flight. Uh, I was at Oscar Flight. Uh, they lost all 10 of their weapons in, under similar circumstances, very similar circumstances, where UFOs were sighted over the launch facilities. Uh, they, had, they had maintenance crews and security crews out there that had spent the night and they were reporting UFOs over those sites. Uh, <clears throat> and the commander of, of that flight was uh, Eric Carlson. Uh, he's, he uh, also separated as a captain, and the deputy commander was uh, Walt uh, Fiegel, uh, retired as a lieutenant colonel. Um, we have those witnesses uh, that I just mentioned, the, the names I just mentioned, are, uh, have, have spoken of this event before, and they will back up this story. Uh, we also have documentation uh, that I received uh, through FOA requests from the Air Force uh, outlining the, the ECHO flight incident and including in, in that documentation a reference to UFOs. We have uh, Telexes uh, covering this incident, uh, and in one telex, it it says uh, the fact that no apparent reason for the loss of ten missiles can be readily identified is cause for grave concern to this headquarters. Uh, this was from SAC headquarters, <clears throat> so we've received we've got those telexes. I've got about twelve witnesses that'll verify parts of this story including um, uh, of a man who investigated the incident afterwards for the Air Force. And you'll hear a little bit more about that with the, from the next witness. Uh, and also uh, another guard that uh, witnessed the UFO <coughs> in that same time period, and another officer who retired a full colonel who had other reports of UFOs. <clears throat> And ciliary to that, <clears throat> excuse me, I've got the complete report on a Minot, North Dakota incident. That was Minot Air Force Base, North Dakota, which happened in August of 1966. Very similar UFO sighted over uh, uh, missile silos. And also a UFO incident that was, re that was investigated by the Air Force immediately after our incident within a week. I'm willing to testify to the truth of all these matters that I've spoken about this in front of Congress under oath. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Dwayne Arneson. I served 26 years as a communication electronics officer in the U.S. Air Force uh, all over the world, including Vietnam. I uh, was lucky to be selected to be commander of three different units in the Air Force. I held the top secret SCI TK clearance, and for those who don't know, it is slightly above top secret. I retired in 1986 as a colonel at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. I would like to relate about three different experiences, if you will, that relate to UFOs. As a young lieutenant over in Germany, at Ramstein Air Base, Germany, back in the early 60s, I was in charge of the cryptographic center. I had a top secret crypto clearance at that time. And I can clearly recall seeing a message that went through my crypto center which said that a UFO had crashed on the island of Spitsbergen, Norway, and the team of scientists were coming to investigate it. Going forward to the 1967 time frame, I was assigned to the 28th Air Division at Great Falls, Montana and I was the officer in charge of the communications center there. Also, I was a top secret control officer for the division. I uh, had a crypto account, I was an account custodian, and I also passed out nuclear launch authenticators. During that time, I can recall seeing a message come through that communications center which said, basically what Bob was just got through talking about, is that a UFO was seen near the missile silos and the missiles were deactivated. Coincidentally, 
My first, the person that Boeing sent to investigate the particular missile conditions, if you will, what made them shut down, was my first manager at Boeing, Mr. Bob Kaminsky, who has since passed away. And I can recall him on different occasions. He lived close to me in Auburn, Washington. That's where I'm from. And he said, Arnie, he says, those missiles were perfectly clean. That was the result. So then one last incident concerned when I was in the, as a commander of the unit in uh, Great Falls, or in Caswell Air Force Station, Maine, I had contacts with the security police at Loren Air Force Base, and they told about UFOs that were seen near the uh, nuclear weapon storage areas on Loren Air Force Base. And I'd be glad to testify to Congress that this is absolutely the truth. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Harlan Bentley. During 1957 and 1959, I was a PFC in the United States Army, stationed north of Washington, D.C. on a Nike Ajax missile base close to Olney, Maryland. In May, this month in 1960 or 1958, about 6 a.m., I heard a noise outside that sounded like a pulsating transformer. I sat up in my bunk, I looked out the window, I saw a craft heading for the ground and crashed. Pieces broke off of that craft, immediately took off again. So <clears throat> there's a lot more to that story, but I've got to speed this up. Now, the next night, I was on radar duty. I get a call from the Gaithersburg missile base. He says, hey, I got 15, 12 to 15 UFOs outside, 50 to 100 feet above me. So I asked him, I said, what does it sound like? He took his head mic off, held it out the van window, and said, here. And the sound, of, the same sound I heard the previous morning, except a lot more of them. <clears throat> so I, my radar was on standby, so I immediately turned it on and got the blip just outside of the ground clutter. I marked it on my radar screen. And then for a few minutes later, all of a sudden they took off. As they took off, the, the sweep came around, hit the blip. The second, when it came around, it hit it again. That blip was two-thirds away off my radar scope. In order to get that far at a constant velocity was 17,000 miles an hour. That was my first incident. Ten years later, by this time I received a, B, a Bachelor of Science degree in Electrical Engineering, and I was working in California. Now, I'm sorry that all I can say is I was somewhere in California working on a classified project that had nothing to do with my experience that I had there. As I was working, and it was like 2 or 3 in the morning, California time, I heard a Houston astronaut communication link, comm link. I didn't pay much attention to it until I heard the word bogey. Of course, my ears picked up immediately, an unidentified flying object of some sort, whether it's a craft, meteorite, or whatever, was on a collision course with that module going to loop around the moon. <clears throat> so basically, I listened for some time, and then I stopped and went back to work. And then I heard, there they go. In the astronaut world, for some of you may, may not know this, there's a term called green turtle. And it used to be, I don't know if it is today or not, but it used to be is you're not allowed to use profanity over the net. And the first person that does that, whoever hears it first and says green turtle, that astronaut's got to buy that man and his entire family a dinner at the most expensive place at Cape Canaveral. Well, to end this real quick, one of them said, damn, they went off, the, the, the UFOs took off. He says, damn, that was fast. And somebody yelled, green turtle. And then he said another word, a synonym to crap. <laughs> and then somebody else yelled, green turtle. And you, and you could see him, he, 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 he grit his teeth, because now he had to buy two expensive meals. And my particular experience, I will testify before Congress if necessary. 
and explain exactly what happened. Thank you. My name is John Maynard. I'm a retired Army. I retired as a Sergeant First Class. For my entire year, 21 years of service, I held a top secret clearance. Compartmentalized at times to as high as TK, Omni, Crypto, and others. I had access to very, very sensitive documents. My testimony is basically two prone. One, I retired from DIA in 1980. And when as an administrator you take over an office, you take over everything and you sign for everything. And I signed for well over 2,000 documents. In order to sign an inventory of those things, you have to read them. Not word for word. But basically, I went through every document to make sure that it was complete. It was there, as they told me, that when I turned my charge over to the next person, those same documents were there. So I got quite a good knowledge of what was going on in those documents. And believe me, there are many, many different references to UFOs. There was also MPIC pictures that shows that it would targeted objects they were casing around. Now, I worked on the SALT 1 and SALT 2 areas for the office that I worked in. So we were taking pictures all the time for the verification of nuclear disarmament. And there were some objects in those pictures that didn't belong there. The second throng, prong to this whole thing is that a lot of people talk about conspiracies over a shadow government. I'm willing to testify before Congress that these black operations do exist. I nearly became part of it. But I saw the light, I think. <laughs> or was it? And I got out. And that's it. We have to disclose what we know. And I am willing to testify before Congress under oath or before any other organization that what I witnessed was true. Good morning. My name is Carl Wolf, and I was a precision electronics photographic repairman with a top secret crypto clearance. In the United States Air Force, I was stationed at Langley Air Force Base in Virginia. In 1965, um, in mid-1965, I was loaned to the Lunar Orbiter Project at NASA on Langley Field. Uh, Dr. Colley was in charge of that project. They had problems with a piece of uh, electronic equipment that was bottlenecking their production of photographs. I went to the facility, and when I walked into the facility, there were scientists from all over the world. I was stunned, actually, to see people at a NASA project uh, from all over the world. It didn't make any sense to me initially. Um, I was taken into the laboratory where the equipment was malfunctioning. I couldn't repair it in the dark. I asked to have it removed. A uh, airman second class was in the dark room at that time. I was also an airman second class. Um, I was interested how the whole process functioned, how the data got from the lunar orbiter to the laboratory. I asked the young man if he described the process to me. He did. About 30 minutes into the process, he said to me, um, in a very distressed way, um, by the way, we've discovered a base on the backside of the moon. And then he proceeded to put photographs down in front of me, and clearly in these photographs were structures, uh, mushroom-shaped buildings, spherical buildings, and towers. And at, at that point, I was very concerned because I knew we were working in compartmentalized security. He had breached security, and I was actually frightened at that moment. And I did not question him any further. And a few moments later, someone did come into the room. Um, I worked there for three more days, and I remember going home and naively thinking, I can't wait to hear about this on the evening news. <laughs> and here it is more than 30 years later, and I hope we hear about it tonight. And I will testify under oath before Congress that what I'm saying is the truth.
Thank you, Carl. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Donna Hare, and I worked at Philco Ford Aerospace for, from 1967 to 1981. During that time, I was a design illustrator, draftsman. Uh, I did the launch slides and landing slides, and also projecting plotting boards, lunar maps for NASA. We were a contractor, but it, most of the time I worked on site, <clears throat> excuse me, in Building 8. I had the opportunity to do extra work during downtime, which was between missions, and I walked into a photo lab, which was the NASA lab, across the hallway. I had a secret clearance, which is not that high, but I was able to go into restricted areas, which this was. Uh, at the time, I was talking to one of the techs in there, and he drew my attention to a photograph, that, a NASA photograph. It had a dot on it, and I said, what is that? Well, he drew my attention to it, and, and I said, is that a, a dot on the emulsion? And he said, and he's smiling, and he has his hands crossed, and he said, uh, round dots on the emulsion don't leave round shadows on the ground. And this was an aerial photograph of the Earth, I'm assuming the Earth because it had pine trees on it, and the shadows of the craft or whatever it was were in the same angle as the trees. And by its very nature, UFO, and I wanted to clarify that to a gentleman that was talking to me, means unidentified. So I did not know what this was. But I realized at this point that it's very secret, that it was kept secret because I asked him, what are you going to do with this piece of information? And he said, we always airbrush these out before we sell them to the public. So they're pes pesky little creatures uh, appearing on this uh, photograph they wanted to get rid of. Uh, after that, I decided I would ask questions to other people that work there. And I found that I had to ask them away from the site and not on site. A guard told me that he was asked to burn some photographs and not to look at them. And there was a guard, another guard guarding him, who was in green fatigues, watching him burn the photographs. And he said he was too tempted. He looked at one, and it was a picture of a UFO. And he was very descriptive. I can go into that later with anyone. Uh, he immediately was hit in the head, and he had a big gash in his forehead. He was knocked out. And he's terrified, so he would have to be protected. Uh, another incident, I knew someone in quarantine with the Apollo astronauts. He told me that the Apollo astronauts saw craft on the moon when we landed. And that is what he told me. And he also was afraid, he said, that the astronauts are told to keep this quiet. They're not allowed to talk about it. So I do want to let you know that I worked out there for a number of years, and this I ran into this. So it's not something everyone knows that works out there for a long time. My boss didn't know about it. Uh, some people that sat right next to me didn't know about it. It's, it's very strange, because I don't know how they can do it, but they can let some people know about it, and then others not. I'm willing to testify before Congress that what I'm saying is true, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and members of the press. I, my name is Larry Warren. Uh, 20 years ago, in 1980, I was a security specialist assigned to RAF Bentwaters, Woodbridge, NATO uh, Air Force facilities in Suffolk, East Anglia. I had a secret uh, security clearance. I guarded uh, our backline nuclear weapons that were stored there at the time, un without the knowledge of the people of Great Britain. Uh, I went through a uh, portion of a three-night UFO event where objects made incursions over our WSA, fired be pencil-thin beams of light into them, and adversely affected the ordnance, possibly. These objects were on the ground on two different nights. Potentially, there was another life form seen. This is an unpopular truth. These events were of extreme defense significance to not only Her Majesty's government, but this government as well, and they are still shrouded in secrecy. Uh, they are very complex, they are very vast. This is more about a human rights issue than just a UFO issue. Uh, 20 years ago, this room would be empty. I see a turn in history. This is history in motion, but unfortunately, it's history with the security classification. I would be more than honored to swear under oath that I w experienced what I did, I saw what I saw, 
these events produced not only uh, after numerous denials by m this government, a memo by Lieutenant Colonel Charles Holt, our deputy base commander, which reads like science fiction. It also produced years later an on-site audio tape he made as these objects uh, performed their feats and did what they did and violated airspace. These events are of extreme defense significance. I hope my brothers in arms that went through these events will be given immunity at some point and be able to join us here. It is an honor to share the stage with all of these peop people. And uh, I think for all of our children, my son Dennis, God bless you, son, um, we can change the world. You're heroes for being here also. And I will testify in front of Congress if asked to. God bless. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, George Filer the third. The reason I'm here is because uh, George Filer the fifth is in the hangar and will be born on Friday. And, I, <laughs> and uh, I'm a retired intelligence officer and flyer with almost 5,000 hours and uh, I didn't believe in UFOs until London Control called us in the winter of 1962 and asked us would we chase one? And we said sure. <laughs> So we let down from 30,000 feet to 1,000 feet where the UFO was hovering, and we went into a steep dive and actually exceeded the uh, red line of the aircraft. So it's kind of dangerous chasing UFOs. In any case, uh, I was able to get the UFO on the aircraft radar at about 40 miles, and we could see a light out in the distance. And as we closed, we kept on picking up this radar return point I'm mentioning that the radar return was very uh, distinct and uh, solid indicating it was some kind of a metallic object. We got about a mile from the UFO and it kind of lit up in the sky and went off into space very similar to what the shuttle looks like when it takes off. Um, later on I was working in intelligence in Vietnam I briefed uh, General Brown about UFOs when I was in um, 21st Air Force, in McGuire Air Force Base, I briefed General Glau about a UFO over Tehran, Iran in 1976 that two F-4s from the Iranian Air Force had taken off and tried to intercept the UFO and when they turned on their fire control systems they immediately went on all the electrical systems went out, the planes had to return to base. This was particularly significant because it was also picked up on satellites. In 1978, on January 18th, I was going into the base. Every morning I did the uh, briefing to the general staff and I noticed that uh, there are some lights off in the distance at the end of the end runway there. And when I got into the command post, the uh, senior master sergeant in charge said that there had been UFOs in the pattern all night. They're on radar. The tower had seen them. They got an aircraft reports and so on. And that one had landed or crashed at um, Fort Dix. Fort Dix and McGuire are right together. And this is kind of like the Roswell of the East. But in any case, uh, an alien had come off the craft and had been shot by a military policeman and apparently was wounded and was heading for McGuire. So for whatever reason, the uh, aliens liked uh, the Air Force better than the Army, perhaps, because they're <laughs> shooting at them. But in any case, uh, our security police went out there and um, found him on the end of the runway dead. And uh, they asked me to brief the general staff, a General Tom Sadler, and uh, at the 8 o'clock stand-up briefing. And I said, I don't think I want to do this. You know, the general doesn't have a good sense of humor, and I'm not sure I, I believe this. So I did some checking, called the 438th Command Post, and everybody had pretty much the same story. And uh, at 8 o'clock that morning, just before I went on, was going to brief this, and I was very worried about it. They said, don't brief it, that it's too hot, so to speak. That's pretty much my story, and I'm prepared to tell the story in front of Congress, and uh, it is the truth. Now, because of this, I've stayed interested in UFOs, and I'm the Eastern Director of the Mutual UFO Network, 
And between the uh, National Reporting Center and Peter Davenport and the MUFON, we get 100 reports a week on average of people from all over the United States that see these things regularly. And if you start checking, they're out there and they're low and people are seeing them all the time. And these are highly qualified people, all of whom essentially give us the reports by email. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Clifford Stone. I was a Sergeant First Class, United States Army. I had a secret clearance with Nuclear Assurity. I could get the clearance that I needed to do whatever it was that was necessary for me to do at the time on special operations when I was called in on those. What I'm referring to here is that I was involved in situations where we actually did recoveries of, tra of crash saucers, for lack of a better term, debris thereof. There were bodies that were involved with some of these crashes, also some were alive. While we were doing all this, we were telling the American public there was nothing to it. We were telling the world there was nothing to it. I'd like to go into detail on some of the cases about the nuts and bolts cases right here, but I will be available if you have any questions concerning my involvement in this. You can talk to Dr. Greer to arrange for me to get to talk to you. But the whole situation is, We've set back, we've told the American people that there's no such thing as UFOs. I've been involved where we have recovered these objects. We know them to be of extraterrestrials. In 1969, I had an event that happened to me while I was stationed at Fort Lee, Virginia. We went to Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania. That would be my first exposure to any time that we would be recovering an unidentified flying object. When we went there, we already had people that was already in the, in the facility. We were a backup team, which was supposed to be NBC because there was supposed to be some nuclear materials that was on board this craft. Later on, most people involved would have been, were, were to be told that there was nothing on board. It was nothing more than just a crash of one of our aircraft. I know better because I was one of the people that approached it with a Geiger counter to get surface readings. I was the first person to go ahead and see that there were bodies on it. That would be the first of approximately 12 events. UFO crashes are not events that take place every day. They're rare. I know we're not alone in the universe. I know that the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. It's evidence that has been denied to the American people. I stand before you today in my almighty God and I tell you this, if Congress calls me in and says, will you testify in detail what you know, I stand here today prepared and ready to do just that. Governments must never lie to the people for no reason. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Mark McCandlish, and for the last 21 years, I have worked as a conceptual artist for a variety of defense contractors. Uh, I've been involved uh, in conceptual artwork or the production thereof for uh, Rockwell on the X-30 program, and also on the, uh, the HYSTEP program, that's spelled H-Y-S-T-P, means hypersonic testbed program. Uh, during the course of my career, I've twice had a secret security clearance. In 1967, while my father was stationed at Westover Air Force Base, the uh, headquarters for 8th Air Force Strategic Air Command, I witnessed and watched through a telescope a UFO which hovered over a nuclear weapons storage facility for approximately 10 minutes and then departed uh, with an acceleration approaching a bullet leaving a rifle barrel. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, in, uh, in 1988, in November, a uh, college buddy of mine, an associate by the name of Brad Sorensen, uh, informed me that he had personally witnessed three flying saucers at a very large hangar at Norton Air Force Base during the course of an air show that was held on Saturday, November 12, 1988. Uh, I subsequently uh, called my congressman from that district. Um, I called his office. This was Congressman George E. Brown, Jr., who at the time was the chairman of the a Congressional Committee on Space Science and Advanced Technology. 
I naturally assumed that since this presentation that Brad talked about was for top military brass and certain congressional uh, individuals, that uh, his office must have coordinated this uh, with the local Air Force Office of Public Affairs. Uh, a male staff member in Congressman Brown's office not only confirmed the exhibit, but the fact that there were three discs at that exhibit. These discs were hovering off the floor without any visible means of support. They were referred to as alien reproduction vehicles, also nicknamed the flux liner because they used high voltage electricity. Um, uh, let's see. To keep things short, uh, this, this is a diagram that I uh, made based on a, uh, a sketch that Brad Sorensen did for me in rough form uh, so, uh, shortly after he uh, had his uh, sighting and uh, subsequently cleaned that drawing up and made it much more accurate. And that's the, uh, the drawing that Dr. Greer is holding there now. Uh, later on, I obtained uh, photographs that were uh, taken in 1967 by a military pilot, Harvey Williams, flying a C-47 for the Air Force at 12,000 feet, approximately 25 miles southwest of Provo, Utah. Uh, this particular vehicle matches the so-called ARV uh, in all proportions and respects in terms of the detail of the shape of the craft. And this was photographed, as I say, in Ju June or July of uh, um, June of 1967. I uh, um, uh, later um, spoke to a, a gentleman by the name of Kent Sellen that I met at an air show at Edwards Air Force Base in 1992, the first unveiling publicly of the B-2 bomber. Uh, he indicated to me that in 1973, when he was a crew chief uh, working on um, experimental aircraft at Edwards Air Force Base, that he had... Um, uh, unintentionally wandered into an area where there was a classified aircraft, namely the ARV. Uh, he described it in detail and he added uh, other details to the account uh, concerning the configuration and the operation of the vehicle that uh, Brad Sorensen was not aware of. Uh, subsequently, Brad Sorensen met with the famous aeronautical designer Bert Rattan, gave him a copy of this blueprint which you've just been shown. Mr. Rattan felt that it was a joke and put it on his wall as kind of a joke. And um, a third party confirmed for me later um, that a Colonel Ray Walsh from Edwards Air Force Base was visiting Mr. Rattan, saw this, uh, this blueprint on the wall and registered quite a degree of shock and anger, wanted to know where the hell he got this blueprint because there was in fact such a craft at that time, approximately 1994, 95, uh, in a hangar at Edwards Air Force Base, North Base Complex at that time. Um, subsequently, I've uh, done a lot of research on this product, this, this, this vehicle. I've uh, come across a number of declassified documents that show that the Air Force, as early as 1960, was wind tunnel testing flying saucer shapes up to Mach 20. And uh, I also have declassified uh, NASA documents that show similar shapes uh, in fact, this is, this is the document here that uh, more or less um, details the, uh, the wind tunnel testing up to Mach 20. This is the NASA doc uh, document right here that was declassified, and it shows a variety of uh, spherical and lenticular shapes that were flight tested up to, or I should say uh, wind tunnel tested up to Mach 6. Um, I subsequently... Uh, obtain a copy of an inner office memo from Hercules Aerospace that describes a particular type of science involving something called zero-point energy and uh, um, uh, scalar waves. Um, according to Brad Sorensen, this is the basis of the technology for these anti-gravity propulsion systems. This particular document here describes six different meetings involving uh, the Defense Intelligence Agency and cooperative efforts with the, the Russian uh, scientific community in investigating this, uh, what is called the fundamental enabling technology that was originally discovered apparently by Nikola Tesla in the early 1900s. Anyway, uh, I could provide you much more detail in, um, at a later time, and I am prepared to uh, testify in detail concerning these events and their truthfulness before Congress. Thank you very much.
Good morning. Uh, my name is Daniel Sheehan. Uh, I'm an attorney and serving as general counsel uh, to the Disclosure Project. I'm a 1967 graduate of Harvard College in American Government Studies and Constitutional Law and a graduate of Harvard Law School. And uh, I served as general counsel and one of the co-counsel for the New York Times in the Pentagon Papers case and was involved in uh, briefing and arguing the case in front of the United States Supreme Court, uh, giving permission to the New York Times to publish the classified documents, the 47 volumes of the Pentagon Papers. Subsequent to that time, I served as special counsel to the office of F. Lee Bailey as one of the trial counsels when we represented James McCord in the Watergate burglary uh, and uh, got Mr. Uh, McCord to write the letter to Judge Sirica to reveal the, uh, water, the Watergate burglar's relationship to the plumber's unit uh, in, the, in the White House at that time. Subsequent to my service in that case, I went back to Harvard to the Divinity School to study Judeo-Christian social ethics and public policy. Did my master's work and PhD work there and became general counsel for the United States Jesuit headquarters in Washington, D.C., assigned to the National Social Ministries Office and their public policy office. It was there in 1967, that, or 1977, that I was contacted by Ms. Marcia Smith who was the director of the Science and Technology Division of the Congressional Research Service. She uh, asked to meet with me, and I met with her, and she informed me that President Carter, uh, upon taking office in January of 1977, held a meeting with then the director of Central Intelligence, who was George Bush Sr., and demanded that the director of Central Intelligence turn over to the president the classified information about unidentified flying objects and the information that was in the possession of the United States intelligence community concerning the existence of extraterrestrial intelligence. This information was refused to the President of the United States by the Director of Central Intelligence, George Bush Sr. The Director insisted that the President, uh, in order to have access to this information, needed to have clearance to contact the Congressional Research Service, to contact the United States House of Representatives Science and Technology Division, to have them undertake a process to declassify this information. Because the DCI suspected that the President was preparing to reveal this information to the American public. The Congressional Research Service Science and Technology Division, under the directorship of Marsha Smith, was contacted by the House Science and Technology Committee and instructed to undertake a major investigation of the existence of extraterrestrial intelligence and the relationship of the UFO phenomenon to this. I was contacted by Ms. Smith and asked in my capacity as General Counsel to United States Jesuit Headquarters, uh, National Social Ministry Office, to see if we could obtain access to the Vatican Library to obtain the information that the Vatican had with regard to extraterrestrial intelligence and the phenomenon of the UFOs. Uh, I pursued that with the permission of Father William J. Davis, the director of the national office, and we were refused access, uh, as the United States Jesuit order, to the information in the possession of the Vatican Library. When I reported this to Ms. Smith, uh, she then later subsequently asked me to uh, participate in a project, which I can go into some detail during the question and answer period or later to individuals, uh, pursuant to which uh, I was uh, given access to, as a special consultant to the United States Library of Congress <coughs> Congressional Research Service, to the classified portions of the Blue Book project of the Air Force. At that point, it was in 1977, approximately uh, May of 1977, I went to the Madison building of the United States Library of Congress. There was no one in the building at that time. It was brand new. I was directed to a basement uh, office uh, where there were two uh, guards uh, at the door and a third uh, sitting at the table who took my identification, uh, verified that I'd been designated as a special consultant to the Congressional Research Service of the United States Library of Congress and was admitted to the room. I thereupon found photographs 
some dozen photographs of what is unquestionably a, an unidentified flying object on the ground that had crashed and plowed a furrow in a field of snow and it was embedded in a bank, an embankment. Uh, there were United States Air Force personnel surrounding uh, this craft, taking photographs of the craft. And uh, one of the photographs, I could see that there were some symbols on the side of the craft. And so I, I proceeded through the photographs and found a close-up photograph of these symbols. Uh, I'd been instructed that I was to take no notes uh, and had to leave my briefcase and all my identification outside of this room. But I had brought with me a yellow pad. And so what I did is I opened up the yellow pad and refocused the overhead camera onto the same size as the, the cardboard backing of the yellow pad. And I physically traced the copies of the symbols on the side of this craft, closed the, the yellow pad back, put the, the microfiche back into the canister, reclosed the box that I had, and I said, it is time for me to leave. And I took this and proceeded to leave the office, at which point the security guard stopped me, and one of them said, what is that you have there, Mr. Sheehan? At which point I handed the yellow pad to him, and he flipped through all the yellow pages and never found the, the copy that I had. And so I took that with me and brought it to the United States Jesuit headquarters, had a meeting with the staff with Father William J. Davis, reported this to them, was authorized at that time by the United States Jesuit headquarters, to make a report to the National Council of Churches and to request that the, United, uh, the, uh, the entire 54 major religious denominations of our country undertake a major study of extraterrestrial intelligence, which they declined to do. Uh, I was subsequently asked to deliver a three-hour closed-door seminar to the uh, top 50 scientists of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory of SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, which I did do in 1977. I'm uh, more than happy to testify under oath to these details to the United States Congress, and would be happy to meet with any members of the press at that time. You may recall I also served as chief counsel to the Karen Silkwood case in which we uh, obtained the rulings in the Karen Silkwood case. I also served as chief counsel in the Iran-Contra case. It was the first one to testify before the United States Congress to the existence of the off-the-shelf enterprise of Richard Secord and Albert Hakim. I'll be more than happy to share the details of what I believe to be the relationship between this off-the-shelf enterprise and the secret government, which is concealing this information from the American public. And I am happy and proud to serve as general counsel to the Disclosure Project. Thank you very much. Good morning, my name is Carol Rosen. In 1974, after being a sixth grade school teacher, I was introduced to the late Dr. Werner Von Braun in the US, the father of rocketry. In my first meeting with him during that first three and a half hours, he said to me, Carol, you will stop the weaponization of space. And I said, uh, you know, teachers don't stop until June. He said, no, you have to understand. This is February, and we have to prevent the weaponization of space because there is a lie being told to everyone that the weaponization of space is now first being based upon the evil empire, the Russians. There are many enemies, he said, against whom we're going to build this space-based weapon system the first of whom was the Russians, which was existing at that time. Then there would be terrorists, then there would be third world countries, now we call them rogue nations or nations of concern. Then there would be asteroids, and then he would repeat to me over and over, and the last card, the last card, the last card would be the extraterrestrial threat. Well, at the time, I kind of laughed when he said asteroids, and when he said extraterrestrials, I knew I wasn't going to deal with that subject. And now we hear on the news just today, this week, that they've slid in another enemy. Only this time we're going to protect our satellites. In other words, we have to have some reason to spend these trillions to waste these dollars on a space-based weapon system, and they're all lies. This is a system, he told me, that would never protect anyone. Even back then, he talked about suitcase bombs. He talked about chemical, viral, bacterial, bi biological warfare that these space-based weapons would never protect us against. 
And then he told me that, in fact, if you travel around the world, which I did after he died in 1977, I met with people in over 100 countries who were friends. They didn't want to build space-based weapons. I became a space and missile defense consultant. And I worked with people around the world. I became a, an advisor to the People's Republic of China. They don't want to build a space-based weapon system. And he told me back then that they didn't. He said, go to Russia. They're considered to be the enemy. I got on a plane by myself. When I got to Russia, I had a list of people that I had read out of the newspaper. Chernenko was in office then. He was the only one I didn't get a chance to meet. They introduced me to everyone when I got there. And when I got back, I said, oh my lord, this man is telling the truth. There are, is no threat. And I've been waiting until this day for 27 years. And I'm expecting the spin to happen because he also explained to me that in the, as a military strategist, as a person who worked on the MX missile, which I did later, he said, you will find that there is going to be a spin to find some enemy against whom we have to build space-based weapons. And now we should expect the spin because he said part of the formula for the intelligence community is if they might have a weapon, then we have to consider that they do have these weapons. So now they do have these weapons, so now we have to build these weapon systems. And that's the formula, except that it's all based on a lie. And we have witnesses here today that have shown you that these extraterrestrial beings, that these craft that have come here are now not UFOs, they're identified flying objects. And we know that they have beings in them. And we have witnesses here who have told you that they can shut down our missile silos. They can stop a rocket going into space that's a test. We have witnesses here who have worked in the classified departments who have the courage to come forward here to support what Werner von Braun told me back in 1974 to 77. And I will testify before the Congress that when I founded the Institute for Security and Cooperation in Outer Space, which I shut down a few years ago because I didn't believe we had a chance with this huge, integrated around the world, complex weapon system, that we had any chance at all of transforming that war industry into a space industry that could provide benefits like Dr. Greer has said of global warming, we can end that situation of that problem. We can end the energy crisis. We can put, build now non-polluting technologies. Werner von Braun used to tell me that we could have cars back then that w drove around off the ground. He described this to me on beams so that we have no pollution on this planet. And we can solve the problems of the people that are urgent and potential and the other animals and the other cultures on Earth and in space. And we can end the arms race without dislocating the industry jobs, without disrupting the economy, by transforming, Werner von Braun told me, the war industry into a global cooperative space industry that will provide, he said, finally, more jobs and profits on this planet than during any hot or cold wartime, more products and services that can be applied directly to solving the problems of this planet, and we can have a whole planet now that lives on pe in peace on Earth with all the cultures on Earth and with all the extraterrestrial cultures in space. And these are words that Werner von Braun told me in 1974. And I will testify before the Congress under oath about everything I have said and more. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank each of the witnesses and for your patience. We're running about uh, 50 minutes late, and I do apologize for that. I want to emphasize that all of these witnesses each could speak for probably anywhere from two to five hours about what they have witnessed. We were trying to give you a snapshot. We have another 400 of these witnesses. I have carried this burden for eight years. I'm now giving it to you, the American people and the people of the world, to take it forward. What I'd like to do now is open uh, the audience uh, for questions from the media. Uh, you may address them to me or to an individual witness as, as you deem appropriate. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Maribel Gonzalez with Reforma Mexican newspaper. I have three questions. One is, if you, if, yes, I wanted to know if, if there are laws in this country 
that in some way allowed this kind of secrecy or not. And then I wanted to know if there's a, a need to change any kind of law. And the next one I wanted to ask you, if you may, is who is profiting from this secrecy that maintains um, in secret the solution to the energy crisis? I mean, well, yeah. let me get to those, okay, quickly, because we are on short on time. First of all, I think initially there was a, an appropriate uh, national security apparatus in place in the 40s during the Truman and also Eisenhower years. By the late Eisenhower years, we have a testimony from Brigadier General Stephen Lubkin, still a practicing attorney, that by the late Eisenhower years that he had lost control of these projects primarily because of the compartmentalization into the military industrial complex, operative word industrial. Um, there are corporations such as SAIC, Lockheed Martin, Northrop, and others that deal specifically with this issue with advanced energy and propulsion systems connected to UFOs. And I think that what has happened from, from the best we can tell uh, from insiders that have briefed me for now about eight years is that we have lost control of these projects from a constitutional law perspective because the infrastructure within military intelligence and corporate channels is so well funded and so complex and labyrinthine that there are compartments within compartments within compartments and people who are in the Congress who make inquiries and in fact President Clinton when he made inquiries were simply denied access as you heard earlier that President Carter was denied access. Um, on your other question, um, I would say that in terms of profiting from the status quo, uh, you know, big oil, uh, there are certain geopolitical and financial infrastructures uh, that would uh, not welcome a, re a definitive replacement to the fossil fuels. Uh, we can tell, I will tell you, and we can prove this with other scientists who are ready to come forward, that we already have a complete replacement for any fossil fuels or ionizing nuclear power plants. We don't need them. We haven't needed them probably have not needed them since the time I was born. Now, of course, this is a major issue. You're talking a multi-trillion dollar uh, global infrastructure change. Uh, and so this does hit the alarm bells at the National Security Council economics uh, area. Uh, however, what is more serious to the national security, keeping the status quo or letting ourselves go into a global ecosystem collapse and running out of fossil fuels and having massive rolling blackouts, not just in California, but globally. We have got to do something about this and soon, and that's why we are advocating open hearings in the Congress. Other uh, media, please. Yes, sir. I just want to know if anybody at the UN is looking into this. Uh, I personally met with uh, uh, Boutros Boutros Ghali's uh, wife, Alia Ghali, uh, who uh, said that her husband was quite concerned about this. Uh, this was in the 1990s. Uh, since then, we know that there have been other people at the UN who have made inquiries. The problem is the UN has no mandate to deal with this. It needs to be given a mandate from uh, its constituent uh, member nations. Uh, and I think that the public and the member nations need to ask that the United Nations get involved with this. This is an international peace issue and an international security issue, and it should be taken up by the UN Security Council. And of course, we are recommending that as well. Yes, sir. So I think my, my question is actually to my question is to Clifford Stone. You, you said that you had seen aliens on a on a craft that had crashed. I wondered if you could describe what they looked like. I could. I could, but it would probably take a whole lot of time. The reason I state that when I got out in 1989, we had cataloged 57 different species. Uh, you have individuals that look very much like you and myself that could walk among, among us and you wouldn't even notice the difference, except for some of the things that uh, they might be able to go ahead, even in a dark room, and touch an object and go, uh, go ahead and identify what color that object might be. They would have a heightened sense of smell, sight, uh, hearing. Uh, the uh, situation is that you have various types of what we normally call grays. We didn't call them grays in the military, but you had at least three types of the grays. You had some that were much taller than we were. Uh, the unique thing I th uh, that I'd like to point out for the most part is that the entities that we did catalog were in fact humanoid. Now this created a situation where the scientific community was trying to figure out why that would be the case. 
because you would expect that if life evolved on other planets, that they would take on some type of other uh, being, so to speak, not necessarily look humanoid or be bi bipedal such as we are. But apparently, we got quite a few of the species out there that are humanoid in appearance. And that creates a question that yet has to be answered by science. Uh, yes, and I'm, as I call on you, please state the news agency that you were with. Uh, yes, yes, ma'am. Deanne Divis with United Press International. Could you please address uh, the vehicle that uh, there was a drawing uh, displayed of? Why would this vehicle be on display at an air show? What is the power source that you are asserting is going to be uh, so very useful? And um, how can you determine that this vehicle is not something um, that is being developed you know, by a government agency? Uh, in fact, I think that was the testimony. This is an alien reproduction vehicle, and just to be clear, uh, this means that it is uh, based on advanced anti-gravity and zero-point energy propulsion systems. Those are the propulsion systems. They are being manufactured by a consortium of companies that include Lockheed Martin, uh, Northrop, uh, SAIC, and other corporations. They do have super luminal capacity, in other words, faster than the speed of light capacity. Um, I think uh, Mr. McCandlish and other uh, witnesses that he's identified could go into more of the technical physics of it. I I'm just a country doctor from Virginia. I tell people, I mean, really. And, uh, but it, it, this is actually what is, the reason it's called alien reproduction vehicle is that it's based on the study of extraterrestrial vehicles, but it is manufactured by human uh, military intelligence, aerospace contracting arrangements. Uh, and this is very important. It means that we, homo sapiens, have the ability to access this so-called zero point field of energy, which the, is the ambient field of energy from which all matter and energy is fluxing and can access that energy and generate all the power we need to run this planet without fossil fuels or pollution. Do you have any direct evidence, though, that this, I mean, we're talking about the same government that so appropriately named a, a snooper program carnivore. So just because it's named the alien reproduction vehicle, considering the history and, and the, the questions that have been existing for such a long time about flying saucers, I mean, do you know, is there any direct reason to believe that this is actually derived from technology? Any of the witnesses who can attest to that? And, and how would this, uh, a propulsion system, a rocket engine doesn't necessarily translate into electricity. Can you elaborate on that? Uh, well, the first part of your question, I would say that the, the, the testimony of, of witnesses we have, some of whom are here, others that are not here, but they're in the briefing materials, is that they have studied, we have studied specifically extraterrestrial vehicles which have been retrieved. The breakthroughs in that research have led to applications that have led to the building of this and similar anti-gravity uh, devices. And that, uh, in fact, uh, this can be proven in open testimony before Congress and that is exactly what we are calling for. We have the witnesses to establish this, and they also then also have the documents and the specific uh, uh, details of the propulsion systems. But this is not a jet internal combustion system at all. It is actually kicked in by a type of electric power source, and it then accesses this ambient zero-point energy field that is uh, responsible for all matter and energy existing and uh, by special configurations and, and what have you, it causes a, a, a cancellation of mass inertia and an anti-gravity effect. And uh, this is a complex technical discussion, which is probably beyond the scope of this conference. But we have materials in the briefing uh, document that we can provide you with references uh, to people who have studied the anti-gravity effect uh, as far back as certainly the 1950s. Uh, we have one witness who said uh, that uh, his family was connected to the RAND Corporation and uh, that uh, by the uh, mid-1950s that more money had been spent on anti-gravity propulsion systems than the totality of the Manhattan Project. So uh, well, yes, we can establish those elements. Uh, other questions? Thank you. Uh, my name is Murray Felsher. I publish a newsletter downstairs here called the Washington Remote Sensing Le Letter that deals with reconnaissance and surveillance of the Earth from space. Uh, my question is this. Since uh, 1972, with the uh, launch of Landsat 1, uh, and now with the launch of commercial space imagery, there are some archived, uh, I would say, upwards of 35 million photographs of the Earth from space. Uh, and not one of them has shown a, 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 
a flying saucer. Are, are you suggesting that uh, these have been airbrushed out? If We're suggesting that there is a uh, system before the public gets hold of anything that's off of a uh, government-connected satellite. There is a compartmented operation that does indeed sanitize them from this type of evidence. And I think the testimony of, of uh, uh, the, the gentleman who, here who was with the Defense Intelligence Agency, Mr. Maynard, uh, Ms. Hare, and others would substantiate that. We have other witnesses who have been involved in projects where such uh, items have been sanitized out. It could also be that if you did a thorough search, you might find a few that slipped through. We obviously haven't had the research uh, dollars to go through all the millions of, of images that are cataloged to look for them, but we do know there's been a very thorough sanitizing of this. And uh, people should not be naive about the extent to which covert programs using billions of our tax dollars have been able to effectively hide this. This is one of the sort of myths of both the media and the public. It's sort of a Pollyanna myth that we, we live in a society where such things could not be done. In fact, they are done, and we can prove that they have been done. Proceedings here, and I'm wondering how your screening process went. Can you tell us a little bit about your satisfaction level with that? Well, I'm very satisfied that, that these are genuine and good people who are speaking truthfully. <coughs> not of the of 400 people that I'm dealing with, not 20 times this number. Uh, have I been fooled? Yeah, I'm an emergency doctor. Let me say something. People come into the emergency department with blank pain, writhing on a stretcher. What have they got? A kidney stone, right? Yeah, well, some of them go into the bathroom, prick their finger, and squeeze blood into the water, the, the, the urine sample, to show that they have blood in their urine so they can get a narcotic injection. Now, have I been scammed as an emergency doctor who has a, you know, I'm bright enough not to, to, to kind of know when I'm being scammed, but have I occasionally? Yeah. Is it possible? It's possible. Is it likely? No. And here's what's more important. You don't not treat or accept the, test, the, the, the testimony or the history of every patient that comes in with blank pain and assume that they're lying just because you've been scammed once or twice. This field, you make a very good point, is filled with hoaxes and scams and what have you. It doesn't mean, however, that all of it is. And in fact, what we're saying after eight years of research, we have found the documents, the top secret witnesses, the insiders willing to testify under oath before Congress that this is true. Now, here's another key point. Some of the people who are in this witness pool, Mr. Sheehan, myself, and a couple of other attorneys, are members of state licensed professions. And what that means is that if we are perpetrating a hoax, we will lose our license to practice medicine, we will lose our license to practice law, we will be perpetrating a hoax upon the public. So what I would say to you is that the group of people before you are very credible, and the others whom we have identified are. We are not the CIA. We have not been able to do a $50,000 background check on each person. I'll give you that caveat. But we have done very serious interviews and vetting. And by the way, these people have presented their DD-214s, uh, their defense forms, uh, other documentation that show uh, the, the two DD-214s and others that show that they were in the military at a certain place in a certain time. So we're very comfortable that, in fact, uh, that the weight of the testimony will carry the day here and that this is real. I had an insight, and it relates to your question. Uh, there have been tens of thousands of sightings and experiences from all over the world. Only one needs to be true. Because if only one of them is true, then the entire case, the non-reality side, falls apart. Such evidence out of the public domain, yes. A priori, all signed agreements and oaths that have flowed from such operations are null and void. What that means is, in any other, in legal theory, is that if, if, a, if it's an illegal enterprise, the agreements those that are entered to as a, as, a, as a result of that illegal enterprise have no legal standing. So one of the things I would like to announce today is all of the men and women listening to this need to know they are free to speak. We are declaring all national security oaths on this subject null and void. They are, have flowed from illegal operations that has no standing constitutionally. My people, my mother's family, who fought in the American Revolution, were prisoner of war with the British to help found this country, did not fight and die to form the United States. 
so that this kind of chicanery can go on. So these men are free to speak, and there can be no legal legal repercussions against them. We have legal counsel who will also support this theory, and we're taking this to other constitutional scholars. It is time for that game to end. It is time for a new era in the human experience. Yes. has also escaped the oversight of the uh, president. We know for a fact that this has happened. I personally briefed President Clinton's first CIA director on this. I was informed that they had no access to these projects, although they knew they existed. I was told the same thing by the senior investigator for the Senate Appropriations Committee, a man named Dick D'Amato, who in 1994 told me that there were somewhere between 40 and 80 billion dollars a year going into these classified projects and that he, with a subpoena on behalf of the Senate and a top secret clearance, could not penetrate them. He told me these were the varsity team of all black projects, covert projects. So this is really serious stuff and it, it brings into question how we gone down the road that Eisenhower warned us about a little too far when he said beware of the military industrial complex, that it can escape the checks and balances of our democracy. And I think on this particular issue, uh, it in fact has, and it's time for um, the uh, Congress to represent the people in this regard and to reassert its oversight of these projects. One last question. When you talk about putting the checks and balances back into place, talk about the passion of these people, if you would. How confident are they? Well, they know what they saw. I mean, these are men ranging from uh, Air Force and NRO officials to people who have been contract uh, agents for the CIA to people who uh, have been pilots uh, in uh, World War II and are heroes of our country, the greatest generation that Tom Brokaw talks about. And so what I have to say to you is that uh, these people know what they saw. They're not going to be speaking about anything except what they directly witnessed. And we're not talking lights in the sky and swamp gas. We're talking people who have actually retrieved uh, extraterrestrial vehicles who are going to be here today. Very good. We'll take one picture of it. That's concrete and that's based on reality. But anyone who does further research in this field will find that they are not hostile. None of them are hostile. They have shown us that they can shut down missile silos and rockets. They have not destroyed us and they've been here for tens of thousands of years. We know of 50 years worth or less of secrets. We know of major... And what, the fact what, what is... What about this hybrid yeah. program that keeps uh, being referred to? Well, again, we're not dealing with these kinds of things. We are dealing with credential, unimpeachable witnesses here well, who have worked in projects. We're, we're not dealing with that. We're dealing with what we know. What we know is that these are not hostile entities. I don't know how to explain this to you, except that people here are all still here. The world is still here. And they have shown us what their technology is capable of doing. And you can yet imagine, and you can hear from witnesses who worked in fields of re-engineering, back engineering, what kinds of technologies can come out of this to literally save people from the suffering that's going yeah, on right well, I, now. I don't doubt the possibility of that. Yes, and that that's what this disclosure is about. It isn't about these other kinds of stories that you have no proof of and nobody does. And the fact is, we well, have proof well, here of well, what we're saying. Well, they, they have removed the artifacts. Well, again, you know, we're not going to deal with this kind of story, and a lot of that is manufactured. Also, that's for sure. 
So what we're dealing with here is concrete evidence, documents, people who have worked in the industry, in the military industry, complex intelligence. Um, I worked in the MX Pistol, and I was the if I went public with that whole story. So you can imagine.